I'm very pleased to be here at what has to be the largest hate group rally of the year here at Callaway Gardens. <laughs> uh, you know, Mary Rothbard used to say, hate is my muse. And, uh, and uh, what's not to hate about the welfare, warfare, police state uh, out there? And uh, when I was uh, uh, asked to give a talk at the conference, I had just written an article uh, for lewrockwell.com entitled Constitutional Neocon Men. And uh, so I thought I'd talk about that theme today. And uh, what, uh, you know, one of, one of the things I was thinking about was that I noticed that uh, all during the George Bush administration, uh, the neoconservatives had a, ma a mantra. The mantra was 9-11 changed everything. So every time Judge Napolitano would be on the uh, Fox News channel to debate O'Reilly or Hannity or one of these people, the mantra would come out. 9-11 changed everything. Here's the judge saying this, the Patriot Act is unconstitutional. Uh, wiretapping uh, without a, 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 a warrant is unconstitutional. The mantra would come out, 9-11 changed everything. And of course, what, what that means is the hell with the Constitution. Constitution, schmonstitution was the mantra of uh, the neoconservatives all during that time. That abruptly changed immediately as soon as Barack Obama was declared the winner of the election four years ago. Immediately, these same people, Rush Limbaugh started sounding... He sounded more like Benito Mussolini during the Bush administration, but he, he transformed himself miraculously into Murray Rothbard as soon as Obama <laughs> took the oath of office. Uh, and uh, even the odious Mark Levin, who uh, Limbaugh calls the great one, uh, Lou does too, Lou Rockwell calls him the great one, but he spells it G-R-A-T-E, the, the, the great one. <laughs> He wrote a book on the constitu constitutional liberty. So all of a sudden, all these neocons are Ron Paul libertarians when Obama is in office. Uh, you know, so 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 they're and they're phonies, in other words, and so uh, you know of the first order. And uh, I'm not speaking of phonies. Uh, uh, one uh, person that, I, uh, that, I, that I'm going to quote uh, that's sort of the theme of my critique here is uh, in the course of doing a little uh, web research on uh, writings on Teddy Roosevelt, uh, a, couple of, a couple of weeks ago I found a, an article by uh, Charles Kessler who uh, works at the Claremont Institute in California. He's one of the, the, uh, the neo, uh, neocons. And if you don't know about the Claremont Institute and their stance, this is the group that gave Statesman of the Year awards recently to, uh, to Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, Victor Davis Hanson, and Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Uh, statesman of the year. So you, you know kind of where they're coming from. And, uh, and uh, Kessler wrote a review of this book on Teddy Roosevelt, and, and, uh, and he said this. He said, and this is sort of the, the ideology of the, the, the neoconservative Claremont Institute. Government must be strong but limited. Think about that. <laughs> so that's like, in, in my notes, I wrote, yeah, it must be short but tall, light but dark. <laughs> Good but bad, high but low, uh, and, and it makes about as much sense as, all, as all, all of that, strong but limited. And of course, this is contrary to everything we know about government, and this guy is a professor of government at Claremont Graduate School with a Harvard degree. And so uh, surely he knows better, but, uh, but he doesn't, uh, doesn't say better. He, he must know better, though. But it's, it's really a preposterous. How is government to be limited anyway? By the Constitution? Well, no, that, if, if history proves anything, is that a written Constitution is all but useless in limiting government. We should have learned that a long time ago. Uh, uh, how about secession? Uh, will, will that limit government? You know, giving people freedom of association? In theory, yes, but of course the last time any group of Americans seriously threatened to secede, the federal government ended up killing 450,000 of them according to the latest estimate. There's, there's updated estimates, by the way, uh, using modern forensic uh, uh, research techniques on the Civil War deaths. And it, and it puts just the southern deaths at, at about 400 to 450,000, whereas it used to be 300,000 is the old number that lasted for about 100 years. And so, well, that didn't really work out either. And of course, the one, one of uh, Murray Rothbard's favorite philosophers was John C. Calhoun, 
who uh, in his uh, famous disquisition on government uh, wrote and explained in great detail why a, a, a written constitution could never be relied upon uh, to, to limit government. You need something else. The people themselves need to be empowered to interpret the constitution, to, to veto unconstitutional laws and so forth. You can never trust the government itself to be the final arbiter of constitutionality. And of course, there, there is no, no bigger haters of John C. Calhoun than the Claremont Institute and the neoconservatives for that reason, because they are the, sort of the purveyors of the nationalist, centralist tradition in American politics. And so uh, the, the most evil thing in the world to them is the Jeffersonian tradition of decentralization. And uh, Calhoun in his day, he died in 1850, carried on the, the decentralized decentralization uh, tradition. And so, <clears throat> and so in, in terms of the role of war, uh, I'd like to just uh, talk about a few historical facts that illustrate this fact that uh, the idea that you can be pro-war, you know, when, when people like Charles Kessler say government must be uh, strong but limited, well, the strong part, he means the military-industrial congressional complex. We must have a gigantic military to protect our freedoms. That's what he means by strong but limited. He means limiting government to the constitutional functions, which are, which are Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, really is mostly foreign policy and war making. And then there's uh, weights and measures and naturalization and a few things like that. But the real big money items have to do with war, uh, defense, foreign policy there. So that's what he means. Well, well this idea that 9-11 uh, uh, changed everything is, is really a, a, a contradiction to what I consider to be one of, one of the best statements the U.S. Supreme Court ever made about the Constitution. And this was a statement that uh, was made in a case called Ex Parte Milligan in 1866. And it was the Supreme Court, uh, Abe Lincoln was finally dead, and so they finally got, uh, got up the nerve to criticize him for having illegally suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, the Chief Justice did at the time, uh, Roger B. Taney, but then an arrest warrant was issued for him, and so he was sort of intimidated, uh, and, and as were other judges. But once Lincoln was dead, uh, the, the Supreme Court, uh, even though it had several of his appointees, were quite heroic in saying this. Uh, they said, uh, I'm quoting, the Constitution of the United States is a law for rulers and people, equally, equally in war and peace, and it covers with its shield of protection all classes of men at all times and under all circumstances. No doctrine involving more pernicious consequences was ever invented by the wit of men that any of its great provisions can be suspended during any of the great exigencies of government. So the Supreme Court in 1866 was saying it is especially during wartime that we have to be vigilant in enforcing the Constitution because we can't trust government to concoct phony wars or phony crises with the intention of grabbing our liberties and throwing them away uh, in, at any time in the future. And so that was the court's way of chastising what Lincoln had done. And, and so, of course, he had done much more than suspend habeas corpus. They mass arrested tens of thousands of northern civilians, newspaper editors, the mayor of Baltimore, Congress, Congressman Henry May of, of uh, Maryland was thrown in prison. A large part of the Maryland state legislature was imprisoned without due process. The grandson of Francis Scott Key was imprisoned in Fort McHenry not too far from where his grandfather wrote the Star Spangled Banner for criticizing in an editorial uh, Lincoln's uh, illegal suspension of habeas corpus. Uh, a, a member of Congress was deported, Clement Vallandigham was his name, for opposing the Lincoln administration. And Lincoln essentially redefined treason to mean criticism of him and his administration. But if you were to read uh, uh, the Article 3, Section 3 of the United States Constitution, it defines treason as follows. It says, treason is defined only, it uses the word only, as levying war upon the states or giving aid and comfort to their enemy. And the states is in the plural. So what else would you call Lincoln's levying war upon the southern states other than levying war upon the southern states? Uh, that's It was the... The, the literal definition of treason in the U.S. Constitution uh, to begin with. 
And so, uh, and so, you know, to argue that we need to have a strong military uh, establishment to protect constitutional liberty uh, does not have a very good uh, uh, historical record. Uh, when I debated one of the top uh, Lincoln cultists in California shortly after my book, The Lincoln, uh, The Real Lincoln, came out, uh, Harry Jaffa, I debated him at the Independent Institute. Uh, after one of my after my first turn, he stood up and said. Abraham Lincoln never did anything that was unconstitutional, and the room of about 200 people just just exploded in laughter, uh, because because <laughs> most of them had read my book, and uh, and uh, that cites all the scholarly literature on this, because you know, generations of historians have never said that they they've called Lincoln a dictator, but they say he was a benevolent dictator, uh, but not, but not Jaffa, who by the way is also associated with the Claremont Institute in in California. And so, so that's Lincoln. And, and then, so this, this established precedents. Precedents are important. There's a book by a left-wing law professor called Our Secret Constitution, and he celebrates the fact that uh, the Lincoln administration pretty much trashed and ignored the Constitution in the North, in the Northern states, because it established precedents for expanding government far beyond what the actual Constitution would, uh, would allow for, or, or even without waiting for amendments to allow you to do uh, additional things that you would like to do with, with government. And so these, these, many of these precedents were used as justifications, in, in quotation marks, for a similar uh, abuses of constitutional liberties during World War I. For example, the Espionage Act, under the Espionage Act that was passed during World War I, uh, there was a 20-year jail sentence and a $10,000 fine for discouraging enlistment. Uh, for, for, for simply criticizing the war which in a way that could be construed, construed as uh, in discouraging enlistments. So there were jail sentences for, quest for questioning the constitutionality of the draft. The draft came in, and if you, con if you question the constitutionality, a few feeble souls, for example, had the audacity to point out that the 13th Amendment of the Constitution outlaws involuntary servitude. And so if you were to quote the 13th Amendment in public, you could go to prison for that. Uh, <clears throat> a movie producer was in prison for making an anti-British movie. Eugene Debs, the Socialist Party uh, candidate for president who won over 900,000 votes, was sentenced to 10 years in prison for criticizing the war. Uh, the government organized lynch mobs to harass anti-war protesters. The postmaster general prohibited circulation of newspapers critical of Woodrow Wilson. There was a committee on public information to spread public uh, uh, government propaganda. Of course, the entire government today is now is a committee on public information. So is the public school system, for that matter. They should call it the, the, the Committee on Public Information. Private property was confiscated. There was a law passed that allowed the president to confiscate any factory or to order a factory owner to produce goods for the military at a price he, the president, deemed appropriate. And if you refused that, you went to prison. You, there's a prison sentence. Uh, private property was confiscated of all sorts. Not only was there a draft of humans, but the draft applied to businesses as well. So businesses could be drafted and conscripted into producing things for the government and sold at prices the government uh, ordered you to be sold for. The Supreme Court rubber stamped every bit of this. None of this could be, it could be construed as, as being constitutional by any fair reading of the actual constitution. But the government, uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, rubber stamped all of it. And here's a, before Woodrow Wilson became president, he was a, a political science professor at Princeton. Let's not, let's not just badmouth Harvard like the judge did earlier. Let's, let's add Princeton in there. And uh, here's what he said about uh, the idea that, you know, after the Civil War, it, it was not, it was not, um, the idea that the black-robed deities of the Supreme Court or five government lawyers with lifetime tenure would be the sole arbiter of constitutionality on all matters, that, that didn't exist until after the Civil War. Before the Civil War, people had the quaint idea that there were three branches of government and that maybe even the people themselves should have a say on constitutionality, not just five government lawyers with lifetime tenure. 
Uh, but when this came about after the Civil War, Wood Woodrow Wilson uh, celebrated this fact before he became president. He said this in one of his books, the war between the states established this principle that the federal government is through its courts the final judge of its own powers. And of course, during his administration, the Supreme Court uh, decided that the, the government should have unlimited powers. And the World War II was a, a repeat of the uh, constitutional abuses of World War I, only many, or, many, time, many orders of magnitude worse than in, uh, in World War I. There was more nationalization. Factories were ordered to, to produce things again. There was price fixing. If the government decided that your profits were excessive, there was a, an excess profits tax. And of course, the worst abuse was the, the rounding up and imprisonment of 110,000 Japanese Americans. Some of them were third generation. Not a one of them was ever accused of a crime, let alone uh, convicted of any crime. But they were put in what FDR himself called concentration camps. This was before we used the phrase concentration camps to refer to the Holocaust in the, in the German concentration camps. And, but uh, FDR used it to describe what was going on with Japanese Americans. Uh, 6,000 conscientious objectors were imprisoned. And, uh, and of course, the Supreme Court rubber stamped all of this. All of this, once again, was uh, found to be, to be uh, constitutional. Fast forward to today's, uh, uh, today's version of this. Of course, the, the, the neocons that I've been talking about, uh, just as a brief review, you know, the Congress gave President Bush the power to declare mar martial law. Bush claimed to have unconstitutional powers of what he, what he called the unitary executive. You, you remember that? The unitary executive. The Patriot Act allows the government to declare that almost anyone who protests government actions as an enemy combatant uh, allows warrantless wiretapping, proclaimed the Bush administration was exempt from the Geneva Convention, permits the government to order individuals and financial institutions to turn over to it private financial information, and then if you reveal it to anyone that the government has been snooping on your private financial information, you can go to jail for that, for, for, for letting people know that they have been doing that. And so, and so every war that we have, uh, we have the government using the war as an excuse to abolish liberties. If there's one article I would recommend that you all read in addition to Rothbard on war in the state that Walter mentioned um, not too long ago, it's War is the Health of the State by Randolph Bourne. Many of you are already familiar with this. It was written in 1918, and when Bourne was a relatively young man, and he died before he actually could finish the essay. It's online in a number of places. But here's what he says on this uh, topic here. He says, during wartime, minority opinion, which in times of peace was only irritating to government and could not be dealt with by law unless it was conjoined with an actual crime, becomes with the outbreak of war a case for outlawry. Criticism of the state, objections to war, lukewarm opinions concerning the necessity or the beauty of conscription are made subject to ferocious penalties far exceeding in severity, those affixed to actual pragmatic crimes. Public opinion, as expressed in the newspapers and the pulpits in the schools, becomes one solid block. Loyalty, or rather orthodoxy, becomes the sole test for all professions, and, and so forth. Uh, another thing he says that I'm going to finish up with is, is he points out that the punishment for opinion during wartime is often far more ferocious and unintermittent than the punishment of pragmatic crime, of real crime, of rape, murder, and, 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 and so forth. And finally, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, conclude with this because Peter is standing up in the corner again over there. Is He says this, the state represents all the autocratic, arbitrary, coercive, belligerent forces within a society. It is a sort of complexus of everything most distasteful to the modern free creative spirit, the feeling for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then the next line is, war is the health of the state. It's the health of all of this. And my time is up. Thank you very much.